What's up, everybody? Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Hey, today we're going to talk about a fun question. At least I hope it's fun for you. It's certainly one that is of interest to me, and that is the question of whether or not Christians should study philosophy. Well, Colossians chapter 2 has something to say about that question, doesn't it? It says this, listen to the Word of God, Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So there it is. Christians ought not to study philosophy, right? Well, that's not exactly what the passage says. The passage says, don't be taken captive by philosophy and by empty deceit according to human tradition. So we're not supposed to be taken captive by it. We're not supposed to be lured in. We're not supposed to be trapped by it, imprisoned by the ideas of an unbelieving and secular world. Uh, as it happens, sometimes the unbelieving and secular world is talking about some very important issues. They just don't have the right answers to those issues if, issues if they're not ultimately in Christ. And that's why Paul says in Colossians 2.8, uh, not to be taken captive by these things that are not according to Christ, but we are in Christ and we are according to Christ. And therefore, I think it makes sense that we should at least know about these things. We should at least have some basic building block understanding of the conversations involved, even if we don't want to ever be taken into uh, prison or captive by these sorts of secular thoughts and ideologies. Well, what's up, everybody? My name is Matt. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh here in Western Pennsylvania. I'd love for you to come visit with us in real life, Gospel Fellowship PCA. Look us up on the internet. All right, let me give you today seven reasons why I do think philosophy and a study of the same is helpful to Christians. Number one, the Bible actually assumes a basic working knowledge of some philosophy. Now, the Bible isn't te technically a philosophy textbook, at least in the sense of what we think of as the, the Greek philosophers or the Enlightenment philosophers or something like that. But if philosophy is essentially the loving of true wisdom, then in that sense, uh, Christianity is a love of what is wise. We love the one who is wise. And so as we're looking through God's word, we're studying the scriptures, we actually do come up with some of these philosophical ideas, concepts, uh, groups, ideologies by name and by specification. So here's one from Acts chapter 17, verse 18. It says, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So if you're working through the book of Acts and you come across this particular line from Acts 17, 18, it specifically mentions these two groups, the Epicureans and the Stoics. And if you're going to do your Bible basic background research, you might want to know something about these groups that are so named specifically and particularly in the scriptures. So as we're working through the Bible itself, it does assume that we have some basic working knowledge of these things. Number two, you know, philosophy, if we're honest, is one of those basic building blocks of knowledge that all educated people want to have at least some kind of a working comprehension of these things. So here's what I mean by that. Now, you should know a little bit about music, right? You should know who Bach and Beethoven are. You should know a little bit about literature. You should know a little bit, maybe even a lot about history. You should know a little bit about geometry, for goodness sakes. And the reason why you should be um, you should be well appraised of all of, of these areas of thought, even if you're not a specialist in those particular areas, is that there is some kind of a basic um, expectation that if you're going to be a learned person, a conversant person with the great ideas of the world that, you know, look, there are certain topics that you want to have some knowledge on. And in my view, philosophy is one of those topics. How can you say that you are a well-educated person if you don't know a little bit about Shakespeare? How can you say that you're a well-educated person if you don't know a little bit about um, British Parliament or early American history or the Greek philosophers. It's just one of those things that educated people do have to have some reasonable facility with these ideas, especially Aristotle, uh, Plato, Socrates, the big three, very important. Several others, though, throughout history as well. We at least want to have some kind of a working knowledge of these persons in their basic ideas. Number three, you know, philosophy it asks the right questions, even if it gets the wrong answers. And, and that's, you're halfway to the gospel if you can do that, right? If you're asking the right questions, <laughs> even if you're stirring up some of the wrong answers, 
I mean, you're you're halfway into a gospel presentation already. Here, here's what I mean by that. If you do a study of philosophy, most of what philosophy is, is a quest for the really important answers that human beings have been looking for in basically every culture, every civilization, and every intellectual epoch of time. So what is philosophy looking for? It's looking for things like happiness. It's trying to define things like purpose and life and virtue and what is truth and what is justice and what does it mean to be courageous. Most of philosophy is simply a search for the answer to this question. What does it mean to live a purposeful and significant life? Now, read through the history of all of the philosophers, whether they're uh, whether they're the ancient Greeks or the more modern Western philosophers, you're going to get all kinds of answers to those questions. And look, a lot of them are going to be wrong, but at least you're asking the right questions about why we're alive. What is the purpose of life? How do I obtain happiness? Now, listen, as Christians, of course, we have specific answers to those questions. We have a very biblical view of what it means to be just, for instance, or what it means to be virtuous, for instance. And we're going to point back to the law and the gospel to help define and frame up these things. When it comes to the idea of happiness, which is one of the great quests of the philosophers, we have an answer to that question. And the answer is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so at least, though, we're talking about the things that are uh, ultimately meaningful and significant. Not only that, but in philosophy, there's also a quest for the purposeful death. Not only is it important to find out what life is all about, but what death has to say about our existence as well. One of the great places in philosophy is the book called Phaedo, or Phaedo as it's variously pronounced. It's the story of the death of Socrates, written by Plato. And in this book, Socrates is comprehending and he's discussing, he's evaluating life and death and the meaning of the soul, whether or not the soul goes on after death. And uh, Socrates is about to have to drink the hemlock. Remember, he's been convicted of crimes against humanity, essentially corrupting the youth and preaching of false gods and things like this. And, and the state is going to execute Socrates. His, his execution is delayed, though, by a festival. And so he has some special time to talk with Cebes and Simeus and Phaedo. And the question comes up of like, what's going to happen to Socrates' soul when he dies? And some of his friends are kind of batting this around and they're wondering, you know, does the soul blow away like wind or smoke? Uh, does it dissipate into the air like the sound of a harp? And Socrates offers a few explanations for why he believes the soul is immortal. And then, of course, Socrates does have to face his death, which he does so courageously. And he tells us that somebody ought to face death courageously like a true philosopher would. And so here in this important of, of Plato's dialogues, we have the very questions that we Christians are waiting to talk about. We want to talk about the soul. We want to talk about death. We want to talk about what comes next. And so here's this beautiful opportunity on a golden platter for us to say, yeah, actually our worldview speaks to those issues direct, directly and very clearly. Let me tell you a little bit about the gospel of Christ. Uh, backing up a little bit even further than that, we can say that philosophy is essentially the quest to understand three basic things about how the world works. First of all, how do you know anything that you know? That's the quest for of epistemology. Epistemology is the idea that um, we should know certain things, we should comprehend certain ideas. But the question is, how do we know what we know? So much of philosophy is taken up in that search. Secondly, philosophy seeks to find out what is ethical, what is good, what is true, what is beautiful. So philosophy, again, even if they get the wrong answers, at least they're asking uh, questions related to right and wrong. So the field of ethical inquiry. And then third is the field of metaphysics, which is to say, what is real around us? What actually exists? Am I in some sort of a matrix? Is this a dream world? Um, are things in front of me actually tangible and real? And if so, how did they get there? What are What is stuff made out of? Look, these are all questions, again, we, we Christians, we have some answers to. Epistemologically, we would say we know what we know because of the revealed will of God in the scriptures. In terms of ethics, we would point to the law. Uh, this is how God reveals to us what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. And then in terms of metaphysics, we would say that the world is the creation of an almighty God who is transcendent over that world and yet never, nevertheless created this beautiful world, as John Calvin said, a theater to display the riches of his glory. And so again, Christianity is speaking directly to the very things that philosophers are questing to find. 
In that sense, we might say that philosophy is empty in a way that Christianity is full. Now, one of the things that you're going to notice, if you ever do a full study of philosophy, let's say in a college classroom, philosophy 101, is you're going to work through the history of the ideas. And then ultimately, um, mankind keeps kind of coming up blank at the end. It keeps coming up empty. And, and in fact, ironically, the further we move into philosophy throughout the ages and the epochs of time, the less and less clear anything means so that by the end, we're looking at nihilistic philosophies that are essentially arguing that there is no purpose in life. And so philosophy, again, gives Christianity the perfect opportunity to speak to these meaningful questions. But we do at least, um, we should at least understand what those questions are. And philosophy helps us to pin those things down. Number five, philosophy teaches us to listen and to think very sharply. Now, one of the most important classes I ever took in college was a class called Critical and Creative Thinking. And I, I said to myself when I sat down on the first day, this class has nothing to offer me. I'm already a critical and a very clear and creative thinker, or so I thought. And then we began to talk about how to build arguments, how to use logic, how to identify fallacies in other people's argumentation when we hear them. Listen, this all comes straight out of Aristotle and his logic. And I would say that we who are Christians and we want to be sharp thinkers, we have a lot to learn about this. Every time the debate season comes around, I remind my children, we sit down and we listen to the debates, whether they're presidential or not. And uh, we go through the informal logical fallacies. We start talking about things like straw man arguments, ad hominem arguments, ad populum argumentation. What is circular reasoning? You know, an argument that tries to, uh, tries to, to conclude what it actually presupposed at the beginning. We look at logical false dilemmas. And so sometimes politicians will say crazy things like it's either war or, in, you know, elect me for president. Well, that's a false dilemma fallacy. It could be somewhere in between or an alternate not even given in your in your choices there. And so uh, logic, especially logic in the study of the fallacies, helps us to make better arguments ourselves as well as to listen more clearly to the faults in other people's reasoning as they share their worldview with us. Sixth. Uh, philosophy has been deeply influenced by Christian thinkers. And so even when you do kind of a cursory or superficial study of the history of philosophy, you end up talking about the thinking of a lot of important Christians. So you've got Justin Martyr and Augustine and Aquinas, especially with his uh, seeking to be able to prove whether or not there's a God. You have Kierkegaard, who's dealing with the issues related to human angst and anxiety in our existence. And all of these, again, are opportunities for us to bring our worldview into the fore and to begin to discuss some very Christian solutions to these problems. And then seventhly, I will just say this, that, um, you know, what, what starts in the hi history books doesn't end merely in the history books because a lot of the stuff is still in the air. A lot of what a philosophy has been wrestling with over the ages is still in the air today. And so you need to understand these things for the purposes of apologetics and the defense of the Christian faith. Let me give you a few of them. Hedonism is the pursuit of meaning in life by way of pleasure. And a hedonist goes out and tries to do whatever he or she can that's going to invoke or to sustain the most amounts of happiness in his or her life. That's why we see our friends going out and getting drunk or pursuing a car, fast cars and, and big careers and fame and uh, fulfillment and Instagram and things like this. We know it's all vain at the end of the day, but that's why they're pursuing it because of the philosophy of hedonism. A nihilism is another one. It's the, sen it's the sense that life is meaningless or random or has no purpose. Our suffering has no purpose. Our greatest loves have no purpose and therefore existence itself has no purpose. And so we see this in those who especially get very prone to uh, depression. There are other reasons for that, but you get the idea. Uh, those who are suicidal, those who are very frustrated with this world, sometimes they've unintentionally imbibed very nihilistic philosophies into their thinking. Postmodernism, the idea that you can invent a reality for yourself, even this uh, this this very troubling movement towards kind of a neo-Marxism with the Marxism of a critical race theory and things like this. Man, this comes straight out of Marxist philosophy. We should definitely understand uh, what Marx taught and why he taught what he taught. So again, look, it's almost impossible to avoid some of these things. And so it would be better for us to get a mastery of these concepts 
while not being taken captive or imprisoned to them. That's the big idea here. So let me give you a couple of recommendations if you're interested. First of all, R.C. Sproul has a great book called The Consequences of Ideas. This is going to take you through 10 or 12 of the most important philosophers throughout the ages. It's going to give you a little bit of taste of who they are and what they taught and a little bit of a, of a response from a Christian perspective. Highly recommend this one. Second of all, though, I should say this. You should at least read some actual philosophers, and Plato's probably as good a place to start as anything. You're really going to like his dialogues because they're there's there it's thinking of ideas in the form of stories most of these are stories related to uh, socrates i already mentioned phaedo or phaedo as one of the great examples of his dialogues i think they're brilliant reading myself and i always find myself um, made the better for having worked through the ideas that Socrates is discussing with his friends in Plato's dialogue. So you might want to get this one. And then if you really want to get into some deeper philosophy, I would say that you should probably work through John Frame. He's one of my professors, his History of Western Philosophy and Theology. It's a brilliant book that uh, analyzes at a pretty in-depth lev level most of the important philosophers and thinkers throughout the ages. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this, what I do in every video, which is to post links to these books so that you can go directly to them and grab them on Amazon. Just toggle down in the description of this video. I'll have links right there at the top of the video. All right. Well, hey, thanks for checking in today. That's pretty much all I have to say in this particular video. Please do know that 